a, I ran a seam route um, because I related it to a play I had in high school. Oh, my God. I just didn't even think I heard it. It meant this, and I just lined up, and I the, the I just lined up, and I ran it. It was funny, Gresh. I'm not lying. You're like I Forrest was like, Gump I was like, the field, just oh, I'm open. And I was like, wow, they're not throwing me the ball. And <laughs> the crazy thing is, I didn't realize it. It was a run. I didn't even realize it. No, it was a run. <laughs> no, it was a pass. I didn't realize it until I got uh, after like after the next play. I didn't even know. I was like, I was like, was everybody all, why is everybody all upset? Like, you ran a seam route. Yeah? Uh-oh. <laughs> I, I couldn't even explain why I screwed it up. And that stuff happens. It really does. And it just, that's it's just the, one thing that always triggered. I probably messed it up in high school, so I just I put it way deep in there. So wherever I heard that word, it meant, you know, this. That's what it meant. Joining us now on the Harbor One Hotline, who has probably been, uh, in a weird way, hysterically laughing if he's been listening to the last 20 <laughs> minutes of two idiots trying to deal with football <laughs> verbiage. Here is the great, soon-to-be Patriots Hall of Famer, Dante Scarnecchia, to break it all down. Dante, good morning, sir. How are you? Oh, I'm doing good, but I honestly want to take two sharpened pencils and stab my ears with them. <laughs> It's been it's been something, hasn't it? It has. <laughs> that is the promo, Nick. We need nothing else. Uh, uh, that's uh, Dante's rejoinder. <laughs> I would say I would say it's riveting radio if you if you like, but it's tough to listen to. Well, here's what I would say, Don. So, Dante, how many versions of offensive verbiage have you been through? Is it just like organically grown to where you sort of understand it and understand that different words can mean different things? Like from a coaching end, I'm curious how you have had to digest football verbiage over the many, many years that you've been involved in the game. Okay. I would always tell the offensive linemen when we would start our meetings, I said, look it, you're going to hear a bunch of stuff in that huddle, and your job is to separate the important from the unimportant. Because And all that, all that words that the quarterback is saying, there's a lot of things that aren't important to the linemen and quite honestly, I would suggest that they're not that important to the tight ends as well. And I'll give you an example. Mm, small and, little debate uh, here between Fourier and Skarnakia. Okay, let's go. Here we have, well, what else is new? <laughs> so, so hear me out, okay? Here's an example of a huddle call in, in, uh, in the Patriot system. Zero out slot, alert zap, sprint 38. Alert Sprint 37 Gut on one. I just said 13 words or letters to you. And if you're an offensive lineman, only eight of those are important. The tight end is to the right. We're saying zero tells us that. That's pretty important. We're either going to run Sprint 38, which is outside zone to the tight end side, or we're going to run 37 Gut, which is outside zone to the open side, and we're going on one. And that's it. Okay, so all those Hard every so out of those thirteen words, every single one of those is pertaining to the tight end, yes? Oh boy. I would say yeah, I'd say that most of them are, although I would say this to you, Christian. Uh <laughs> zero out slot alert zap. You don't care about alert zap. No, I don't care about alert zap. So okay, so that's okay, so let's uh throw so that one out. So I'm 11 now. I'm at 11. <laughs> All right. Christian, you're going to lose sure this. I, wait, no, wait. You're going to lose this, wait, Christian. Let, I want to play this out. Okay, so 11 are important. For me. Yeah. Yeah. Which uh, I think well, wouldn't you say though that yes they are. Wouldn't you say though uh for I mean, first of all, that is – uh, we were just talking – I think that's an important cue. Like, you have a tendency – you just want to listen to what pertains to you and you don't want to be preoccupied with anything else other than that what you need to do. That is that is an obvious uh, obvious point that I think that linemen get the benefit of, I guess, for the most part. I think there's probably truth to that. 
Look at that. I know, Christian. You know oh, what? It, no, you worked it out. Dante, what I do want to ask you, though, is Christian had that play sheet of the, the first 15. Of he was rolling out those plays, and it stood out to me that the, the snap count that you wanted to run it on, the whole on three, stuff like that was worked in there. Was that commonplace as you knew it, Dante, to when you script out that first 15? I'd only ever dealt with, hey, here are the plays, and then whatever they got run on, they, ever, they got run on. But I know Christian's had the snap count in there. Is there a psychology to that, or am I just overanalyzing? I think, it's, I think the more information that you can give them ahead of time, and then you go through those scripts, then they the custom to what you're going to do. And if, if they get into a comfort zone as a result of that, what could be easier than that? And that's really important is that everyone plays from a, a you know, a, where there's athleticism and your skill set, just play it paralyzed by a bunch of words that you hear in the huddle. Have you, I think that's the way you got to play. Have you ever, um, like went to like had a, a coach's meeting and said, "Listen, we need to shorten this play out so guys aren't getting tripped up with all the verbiage." Uh, there may be times as a staff where you sit down and say, "You know, really, this is we're on this one to make it a little easier." And there's also times where you know, in in your uh, chance to be successful and a lot of times that involves check with me we're going to either run the run to the weak side or run a run or a play instead and sometimes you can get just so much so just you know there's too many guys wait on things so let's try to cut it back and reduce it and i think that's part of self analysis and doing the things necessary to get the players a chance to be as aggressive as they possibly can be. Hmm. Uh, Dante, your phone is a little uh, crackly, so our guy Nick is going to – I'm going to put you on hold here so that Nick can kind of uh, reconnect. Nick, let's see if we can uh, reconnect with uh, Dante here and see if you can uh, get that squared away so that we can get him on a clean line because he is I'm dropping... On the, I'm on the edge of my seat with, with the knowledge. He's dropping knowledge on I us. I want to hear every last word of it. Right, uh, so uh, hopefully Nick can... Uh, we'll get that connection cleared up and all that kind of stuff, but it is interesting, the whole... It is it, What he just took us into was what we were talking about. For certain position groups, there are only certain things that connect and all that. I do want to get into the whole what was going on in Green Bay, all yeah. that kind of there stuff. All right, here we go. Now we got our friend Dante Skarnecchia uh, back up and running in. Dante, I want to jump into the joint practices and ask you, when was there sort of the turning point uh, in your career where... These joint practices almost meant more than the preseason games. I know it isn't that high-level game speed that you might be able to create in a preseason game, but when was that kind of turn, and then how do you go about uh, evaluating that kind of tape against someone else? Are you breaking it down as if it is like game film and it was like a preseason game? I think I think those uh, those practices against other teams are far better than the preseason games, and for this reason, your quarterback shouldn't get hit. Okay, that's one. So you can screw some things up, and he's not going to be laying on his back as a result of it. Well, which is what would happen in a game, and and then because you're in that comfort zone, you can go ahead and have the quarterback take a bunch of reps against the other team's defense, and, you know, not worry about it. They're going to, and then as a result of that, they get invaluable uh, repetitions that mean a lot more than what you'd see in a preseason game because you're scared to death about getting them hurt. So as I as, – as in my last four years when we, we did those, uh, you know, uh, practices against other teams, I, I – all of a sudden uh, it hit me and I'm saying – hell, we're better off doing this than 
sending them out there in a preseason game and worrying to death that somebody's going to get hurt because you don't. The other thing is you're going to see things at that, those practices that they they wouldn't show you in the preseason game because they don't want everybody to see it. And so you go ahead and you practice against it, and you're a lot better off for that process than you, than not. And I, I I just think the world of those things, and I think it's really important to to do them. So Dante, was there were there any situations where you would go to their defensive coordinator or vice versa and say, hey, "Listen, can you show us this? We're trying to work on this." And would they, you know, uh, kind of help you guys out with that, and vice versa? Yeah, I th- and I think there's a lot of give and take on both sides of it. You know, where you know they say, "Hey, you know, can you give us some empty formation in the two minute huddle or two minute drill?" Um, you know, we're gonna run. There were times against other teams where we would go goal line and, you know, goal line is something that you either got, you're either all in or you're all out. And so we would tell them, hey, we're going to run goal line and it's live. And and live meaning that they're going to tackle the back and and we're going to cut block their down guys. And it takes a pretty strong coach to say, all right, we'll accept that. If we go goal line in a preseason game, we're cutting the hell out of them anyway. So at least they all know it. And everybody's prepared for it, and we're prepared for what they do. So I just think that that the the common thing is this is all done for you to get better and for us to get better. And uh, I I just love those practices. Dante, is it uncommon for an offensive line at this point in the preseason to be – sort of trending the way they should be in the run game, but struggling in the passing game a little bit, or the fact that there are some pass game struggles, is that a little alarming to you, even though you're on the outside now? Well, I don't know. I I don't know how much they're struggling with their best guys out there. We all saw what happened the other night, you know, and, and Hey, look, I'm for playing all those young guys as much as you can and, and, you know, accelerating the, the growing process with those guys. Because one or two of those guys may end up playing this year. You never know. So I, I would hope that, you know, here in the second preseason game, and, you know, especially this week when they're practicing against Green Bay and they're not having to uh, block Uche, they're not having to block uh, Judon and those guys, and all of a sudden it may, it may a little bit better and it may still be a struggle i don't know but i would hope that they you know are at about this time and certainly by next week that things would be a lot better and and more the way that they want them to be so last one for me dante what is your overall tolerance for fighting during camp or during joint practices uh zero and i thought that that's the best thing that we did was that the head coaches Always, when they said, Look, we, let's practice against each other because we're playing you in the preseason, but here's the deal. There's not going to be any fight. And each coach, because remember, you know, the let's say the Green Bay offense is on one field, the Patriot offense is on the other field, and there's only one head coach for each team. So whoever, whatever field the head coach is on, if two guys engage in a fight, that head coach, whether that's your player or not, has the right to send those guys out of practice and off the field. And we, have, and we agreed to it. And, and we never had problems. We never had guys or brawls or anything because the head coaches were strong. They were on the same page. They would stand up in front of their teams, and they would stand up in front of both teams and say, Amen, you fight, you know. This guy's got the right to throw you off the practice just as I got the right to throw you off the practice field. And that's how it's going to be. You know, I, I was talking yesterday. They had 13 fights in one of those, you know, common practices. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, and I was, I was curious um, just from your long, long tenured experience in the NFL coaching as long as you have, especially the offensive line, have you ever heard of a coach – kind of uh, ask a, a player to kind of start a fight, to kind of get some juice flowing, to get some competitive, like, energy going at practice? No, I never – I'm not doing that. I, I just don't think you need to do that. Look at 
I think it's all about standing up to the competition and competing every down. And that's what you do. And if, I think that if that mentality permeates throughout the room, you know, the room that I'm in coaching, I think that it's going to look the way you want it to look. But look at and I've always told them this. You can either be the hunters or you can be the hunted. Choose your poison. You want to get pushed around out there? Go out there and let them push you around. All right? Or when they push you around, you stand up to them. doesn't mean you have to hit them. You just stand up to them, and you're not, and you're not standing for it. And you hit them when you got a chance to hit them and give them a good hard nudge when it counts the most, let it go. Okay? And let you just Because if you just take it all the time, everyone's a bully, and they're just going to make it hard. Or you just say, hey, we, we ain't tolerating this. We're standing up to you, and, and we're going to compete every down. And I, I, We've always made that point to them, and they've always responded pretty well. Dante, last thing from me. The Patriots signed Ezekiel Elliott. I know Christian and I were talking yesterday about how it doesn't matter which one of those guys is in. You still have the run, pass, go. Whereas it felt like at times with the Patriots offense, there might have been a tell based on who was in the backfield. A, do you subscribe to that theory? B, you know, is there something there in terms of stylistically Ramondre and Zeke that are very complementary to each other and really give you no drop off in the backfield when it comes to the offense? Yeah, I think both those guys, Ramondre and Ezekiel Elliott, have proven that they can play in the National Football League. Uh, I know that uh, Ramondre is a, a real threat out of the backfield, and I also know that so is he. And the more you can, you know, have a, a guys that have the ability to do that, to run with speed, to run with fine- speed and power and finesse when, it, when it's required um, and are able to, Catch the ball, I think it just it gives you a two-headed monster that, you know, you put one in for the other and not, there's no drop-off. And if you got that ability, I think, you know, that's a pretty good thing. So I think we're all anxious to see in which direction that goes and see what Ezekiel's like at this point in his career. And the other guy we know, three years in the league, and is, on, is on the upswing. And so we just got to hope that it, it's, a you know, again, Two guys that can really make things hard for their, the defense, and I always believe that. I believe this with all my heart. Good backs make the lines better, make the linemen better, because they'll find holes, especially those backs that have um, great vision. They'll find what's there, and they'll hit what they'll hit it into what's there, and usually do pretty well with guys like that. Well, Dante, uh, thank you for uh, sticking with us here. Uh, I'm sure we are not the first tight end tackle combo to make you want to stick pencils in your ears or eyes. So I'm glad that uh, we've <laughs> I'm glad we've made the list. Uh, the great yep. Dante Scarnecchia. Thank you for your time, Dante. We appreciate it. We look forward to catching up next week. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Well, I'm glad I'm not playing line in, in the San Francisco or Miami system because I couldn't figure that shit out. <laughs> Thank you. That is oh. that's as big a mic drop wow. as we're ever gonna get, baby. I tell you what, that is was there, there is a, awesome. I'm not. 